lunch. Now they're armed with this information. They can retell the story very easily. Phyllis is a waitress. Right? All of these things fill themselves in. Let's fill them by themselves. Phyllis and I always talk and land. They're good friends. Right? Everybody eats, eats, and pays. The story again fills it in because they've heard it two times now. This is their third chance here. Got a lot of repetition. And even your lowest of level students, they're getting additional exposure to the story. They're hearing all those vocabulary again. They're getting that key set structure. They're getting the proper English again. Even if they're not fully comprehending it, they're getting a big picture of the users. And so at least they're engaged. And the picture is help tell the story. They're not losing students during the story. And he puts the money on the table, the money is for Phyllis, this is her tip. One day, obviously you're getting a person. Some levels are a little bit higher, and some are lower. What's his name? Uh, if they get stuck on a blank that they don't know, I can drop that hint. He pays for his breakfast. Lunch? Okay. You can easily guide them to the answer. Okay, again, then he asks Phyllis, do you want a tip today? Or do you want half of the time? By the way, take it. Half of the lottery ticket, Phil says. Yes, Bob says. I have a lottery ticket. If I win the lottery, you get half of the phone. Money, Matt, give me money. Okay. And Phil says, okay. I don't want a tip today. I want half of the lottery ticket. Should I say that? Now, the key to this story is also, is introduced at a comprehensible level. The first time I showed this, I only showed you the pictures. I didn't show you any words. I, I was in control of the story. I dictated the event and who answered the questions. If you handed out the story, you go over the words, the highest level students, zoop, at the end. Teacher, I know what happens. They win $6 million. You've got to slowly guide them to the end of the story. Now, I put up the words. Now we can see it here and here. Okay. The next day, Bob wins the lottery. He wins six million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Bob goes to the Italian restaurant. Here's your tip, Bob does, fellas. Three million dollars. Now I say, okay, let's analyze this story. Bob, see a good guy or a bad guy? He's a good guy. Okay, is that a little bit of money or a lot of money? You can imagine a very appropriate student who goes crazy. They can run around and jump on the desks and 
So Bob needs to get you to try harder. <laughs> Again, if you want to put on an eye patch, you want to put on a hat, a little parrot, you're only going to make your environment more entertaining and more interesting for yourself as well. I never have more fun upfront teaching is when I make a fool of myself. Take your work seriously, don't take yourself seriously. You do jumping jacks, all three middle school. Boys, all right, you look like you want to get up and do some jumping jacks. You look tired, come on up front. You can read it in jumping jacks. Jumping jacks, jump ropes, hula hoops, all different stuff. Get them up and get them active. But I know middle high school students, like you're in the max sleeping, cast out, whatever. They had a fun night in there before, I don't know. A opera singer, they can sing. If you have some students who are inclined to do this, you get volunteers. So how do you drop it? Father Ted. Now, for people who aren't from the States like me, you might not know what this means. Got to bump a little slower. <laughs> Got to wave a little bit. I'm not having my own. Very good. Very good. Yeah, okay. If you can imagine all of these, just make your quest that much more exciting. Now, I always say that if you find this works in your class, do it again. This never gets over. In my class, they enjoy it, so we keep doing it. But if you're a middle school teacher, and they like doing the jump rope reading, and you want to do a timer, they set a, an egg timer on the front desk and say, you've got three minutes to read the story. Ball jumping rope. They might like something like that. They're not a lot of interest. They're not a lot of that. Okay, hey, you love plans. Okay, the next part. We all have different students in our class who enjoy doing different things. Some will really like getting up and reading in front of the class. Others will hate it and they will never volunteer to do it. Which I say, oh, it's great for you. If you want to be quiet during this time, during your silent phase, no problem. Never force anybody to do anything in your class. If you're not ready to do it, you either feel uncomfortable because it's not, well, it's too difficult, too easy, or you're just having a bad day. No problem. I'm not going to get stressed out over it. Neither should you. So I let them pass. So I gotta give them something else to do though. So I will give them the story. The pictures will need to be. And they have picture lenses. So unless they can read the story, they can't illustrate the story. So they've got to work with their partners, read the story and illustrate it. Okay? Then I need some money to the lottery. This is a story about winning the lottery. Tell me what would you do with the money? So it gives you some flexibility. students enjoy writing, I'll tell them, write me a more detailed story. Bob is a 54 year old from Borsay from Manhattan Beach, but he really likes to eat spaghetti. He likes to eat red spaghetti and sausage. Right? They can personalize the story themselves. They can think up a whole new story. This isn't Bob, this is Vinny. Right? And Vinny likes veal parmesan. Right? They can make their own story themselves. And I have some students who say, teacher, I want to write an easy story. This is Bob. Bob likes spaghetti. Bob eats spaghetti for ideas. Okay, it's no problem. As long as I'm getting output from my students, I'm happy. They will work at their level. Now, a lot of people ask me why. My students, they're at such different levels. How do I know if it's appropriate? Well, students don't want to waste their time either. So they will pick the appropriate level for them. Now, sometimes I give dictation tests for my students. I need three tiers, A, B, and C. And there'll be the vocabulary words for that week. Level A will have nothing but blanks, right? There are 12 blank lines. Level B will have a word box for them to use. And level C will have the first letter of each word written for them. And so I'm meeting the students where they are. I'm fulfilling their need. And students sell the letter. I put A here, B here, and C here. Come up and take which one you want. Be so surprised how often people go for the higher level and not the lower level. Same for this, they're going to give you more than you expect. This is really cool. All right, so we've got the interest of the story. Again, you can draw a little bit of the green on the top. I know what I have the first picture and the second picture and the third picture. Okay, then getting them together. When it's partner time, they need an opportunity to work with somebody who will challenge them. And most people put their students at a high level and low level together. I say don't do that. Um, I think it, takes, it steals the incentive from the person who has to carry the group. 
right? And it allows the person who's at the lower level to be cowering. And then both of them are not learning any new lesson from that. So I always say, pair them with like ability students. Because the, your higher level students, you give the paper and take over. And they're all going to work fine, right? They're working with very little need for supervision. Whereas if you pair two lower level students, you know that they're going to need supervision, that they're going to need assistance. So you pair them up less, and that's where your focus can be. That's where you're most needed in the classroom. So when I pair them up with a partner time, especially for these kinds of activities, I'll, par I'll pair them equally. I would like those students. And when there are other activities, I use randomizers. You know, like pick the chopsticks, or I have picture cards, peanut butter and jelly, Mickey and Minnie, Donald and Goofy. Washing machine and drive. And I'll put one card to each student and I'll let them pick that one. Sometimes I let them pick their friends. Sometimes I line up girls and boys and do their partners. Randomizing the cartridge really works, but you can't always do high level. You gotta give it some semblance of fairness if you don't want the one student to carry the other over you. They'll start to resent the English for that. Okay. I have to work smart, not hard. Uh, again, if something is working, keep doing it. If it's not, it's not. Okay. Now, a lot of people are new. Who is their first time teaching in a classroom? Anybody? Okay. Look at you, man. Who's been here a year? A year. About a year? Who's been two or more? Okay, so we've got a lot of people here with a lot of experience. Now, I always say the struggle you're in today is developing the strength you need to learn. Right? I'm learning the lesson here, but I have to go back and apply it. Because if you wait until next semester, if you wait until your winter came, if you wait until next March when school year starts to try to implement something you learned in this workshop, you're going to forget it. You're not going to do it. You're going to say, oh, that's a good idea. And you'll be out of the game. But if you go back on Wednesday, you say, you know what? That storytelling circle question really worked. I'm going to do that in my textbook stories from now on to get everybody warmed up. That's great. Or if I said, A, B. One, two. One, two. Oh, yeah, sure. That'll get their attention. Maybe I'll use that next time. All right, so you've got to get today and tomorrow and use it immediately. Okay? Always have that voice in the Go right, right back to music. Okay, so what we do, and if you have a, a classroom where students are doing activities and students are constantly working in pairs and groups, or they're doing activities like this when you're drawing and they're writing, what are you supposed to do? It's kind of bedtime for teachers. Questions? So if you're working on something, I have to say, do you like apples? Yes, I do. Okay, now a lot of teachers just boom, stop, all right, that's great, thanks. thanks. Now that student just gave me an answer and I threw it away. Instead, I can say, you do like apples. you like apple juice? You do. Okay, you like apple juice in a mug or a cup? Okay, a cup. Now, when you finish your apple juice, do you wash the cup? Oh, I'm sure I don't know what you said. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> now I have to figure out exactly where he is, what level he's at. And that's great. I just got three questions instead of one for And he feels like there's a much more personal conversation with him. Now, I said, here, do you like pizza? Yes, I do, of course. What is your favorite pizza company? Do you like pizza the pen, pizza school, Anna? Pizza, okay. Do you like to eat in the store or do you like to take it? Take it, okay. Take it. Do you like what kind of hot pizza? Combination. Now, when you eat a combination pizza, what do you drink with it? Not new, okay. Not new, not new, not new. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got to a higher level with this student. And of course, he's one of our native teachers, but you can see exactly. <laughs> Sometimes you get a conversation with your students. Oh, don't make me come sit in my office. Let's have some call, right? Others, okay, you like pizza, and that's enough. Now, I also do this when they come to class and when they leave class. So when my students came to class, Beginning of my first year, at the beginning of my first year, they used to run 
run into this chaos, like a whirlwind. There's a tornado in the way. Monsters. I'm a zookeeper. You know? I'm, I'm not a teacher. So I have them sit down in their chairs and they're yelling. Uh, I said, please don't sit down and be quiet. <laughs> it's terrible. I hate it. So I realized, okay, they're coming in here with that attitude and it's accepted by me. So my second year, I start throwing them out of the question. Okay, that didn't work because they'd come back the next time and they were equally as bad. I said, okay, well, that's not working, that's not working. And I started kidding the students and that worked. <laughs> I thought, okay, I can't get them, I can't you know, curse them out. It's not going to work. But I said, if they're coming into my class and thinking this is acceptable behavior, I've got to get them calm, I've got to get them relaxed. So everybody in every class, is greeted at their homeroom door by me. Because most homeroom teachers just send their children, oh, here's my lovely students, take them, and they run down the hallway and they run to your classroom. Right? So it's already chaos before they've even gotten into your classroom. I said, okay, how do I deal with this? I'm going to go to the source. Right? I'm, going to, I'm going to stop this before it gets out of hand. So I went to the homeroom door. Hello, teacher, I'm here. What are you doing here? I'm taking your students to my classroom. And now that the teacher sees the responsibility is hers. Because most of them just come. Right, so just, just get, get out of my classroom. Right? They want that 10 minute break also. So they send them to me as soon as that bell works. And I still have students in the class, and the other ones are lining up. So I went to their own classroom, and I started to walk them back to the English class. And the first month that I did this, it was, again, it's chaos. Right? So, okay, what are we going to do? We get back to the class. If there was some problem in the hallway, fighting, yelling, cursing, someone who didn't have a book, all right, everybody, let's go back to your homeroom. Line up again in front of the door. Now I'm looking at the teacher a second time. And I'm getting nervous thing kind of <laughs> There's no need for language communication. My body language, my facial expressions. You might feel uncomfortable doing that, but that's okay. It's worth it. Because <laughs> you go back to my classroom the second time, now all those troublemakers, and they were asking him class leader, what happened? So he said some bad words, and they were fighting, and he pulled his pants down, and somebody was going to stop. Whatever, they're doing their kids. Okay? So we can't just expect them to know that this behavior is okay. But it's not okay. So I have 